Hello and welcome to this uh, session of the AHE 22nd annual uh, conference. The first, we've said this 22nd annual online conference, but I think it's probably the first. Um, the first we've got online. Uh, and it's a, a pioneering experiment by the association, so we hope you enjoy it. This is session five, uh, teach, uh, teaching heterodox economics or heterodox approaches to, to teaching economics, however you want to phrase it. We've got four uh, speakers. We're going to allow a few, a couple of minutes to, for people to enter the room uh, and then we'll get going. Um, so please uh, relax for the moment. Um, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, if you can do that through the Q&A box, please. Uh, note that you will be muted and your videos will be muted. Um, so you can only communicate with the panelists through the chat box. If there are any technical issues, you can communicate those to us through uh, the, the chat box. Um, please, uh, if you're into tweeting, uh, feel free to tweet about this event. Uh, the hashtag is um, hashtag AHE2020. So we're good to see some activity there. And we'll get going in, in just a minute. Should note that the uh, session will be recorded, um, but that will only record um, uh, panelist faces and voices and things like that. No nothing else will be recorded. If I, can just, if I can just retract what I just said. The, um, if you put questions in, um, it'll be a, the, the, the they'll be identified by your Zoom name into the Q and A. So if again, remind you to put questions into the Q and A, uh, and then any technical problems, put them into the chat. Okay, so um, I think we'll we'll get we've got quite a few people in now. Um, so let's just get started. This is a session that um, I'm really quite uh, excited about four really good speakers and four really good papers um, so we will um, start with Michelle Michelle Thunewelt from uh, and also Joanna Negru uh, Michelle is uh, broadcasting us through from uh, South Africa and uh, Joanna from Romania so uh, this is a very international session so that's great and as you can see on the screen now um, Michelle is talking about, uh, and Michelle and uh, Joanna are talking about uh, this topic of post-colonial theory and pluralism, particularly in this uh, in international uh, African context and applications for economic pedagogy. So over to you, Michelle. Thanks so much, Andrew. I really appreciate it. Uh, yes, so that uh, Andrew has really nicely introduced the title of our talk today and we're um, going to hope to spend a couple of minutes specifically talking about the applications for economic pedagogy. Um, so I'm going to try very hard to uh, stick to the time. Um, I am hoping, I was hoping to do full screen, um, but uh, the slides seem to work better when I leave it in uh, this mode. Um, and I, I suppose I really wanted to just uh, start my presentation um, with a picture. Uh, of a photograph that was actually taken by um, Hassan Hafiji in 2016. And so this picture is um, taken during the 2016 Fees Must Fall student protests uh, that happened in South Africa. And so sometimes I think one can get very caught up in the research behind uh, your topic um, and in trying to see how this is the next research output. Uh, and so, you know, this picture is just a reminder to me that students put their bodies on the line um, and that they fought for something that you know, we owe to them as academics to continue striving to better uh, the type of economics education that they receive. Uh, so I think it would be remiss of me to not first um, just be very explicit about my own positionality. Um, so whilst I have been raised um, and lived in South Africa my whole life, except for I'm um, going to pursue my postgraduate studies overseas at SOAS in London, 
Um, and much as my university may be based in South Africa and the global South, I may be a woman, I do think that it is very important for me to acknowledge and reflect on my own positionality um, in terms of the white privilege uh, that I have, especially when I'm engaging with decolonial and post-colonial work. Um, and so I know that that is a, a commitment that Joanna feels uh, strongly to. And so sort of our, our motivation behind this, I'm not gonna spend too long on this, but really uh, was born out of the frustration um, from my own uh, economics education here in South Africa uh, and just feeling like um, it had not reflected the economic realities that I saw all around me. Uh, and so when I started uh, teaching and I'm a full-time academic here in South Africa, also a real frustration in wanting to reform curriculums, but feeling like um, there wasn't necessarily enough um, African scholars that had been taught to me uh, in order for me to feel like I could truly reform my curriculums. And so this has really been a journey of me trying to do better uh, for my own students. So sort of as a point of uh, departure um, is the work of uh, Sabelu Nlobu Khacheni. And so, you know, he, he speaks about the right, the right to think, to theorize, to interpret the world, to develop your own methodologies and to write from where one is located and be unencumbered by Eurocentrism. Um, so too, Bupentura de Souza Santos talks about the diverse ways of knowing. Um, and so I think we are very strongly draw from the work of Zain al Abdin, who's going to be speaking, um, I think on the 31st of July at this conference in one of the plenary sessions, I have a childlike excitement. I can't wait to, to hear her speak. Um, but she points out in her Cambridge Journal of Economics 2009 paper that economists have not engaged with post-colonial thought and to their detriment. And so in the spirit of interdisciplinary work that Nlobu speaks about, um, we are drawing from post-colonial thought and African philosophy. Um, and so whilst I'm going to first start off by touching on these more theoretical contributions, um, I'm going to try to spend uh, the last part of the presentation talking about the application specifically for economic pedagogy. So uh, in terms of post-colonial thought, Zain al um, and Chara Sheila in their 2004 book, Post-Colonialism Meets Economics, um, talks about the importance of post-colonial thought being seen as a cross-cutting frame across different heterodox uh, traditions. Um, and so we think that, that that is a very useful understanding of where we can begin to draw from in terms of post-colonial thought. Um, but so too, that post-colonial thought draws very strongly on culture as a central analytical category. And so I do think it is important for um, me to emphasize that you know, um, we are keenly aware that culture is a uh, particularly diverse, nuanced, con complex concept and that there's no unanimous conceptualization of it. Um, but so we think that this is where pluralism, at least a part of where economic pluralism lends itself really well um, to this idea about uh, culture as a central analytical category. Um, and so, you know, we would in an ideal world absolutely love it if um, people saw economic pluralism, not just as a tolerance of a multitude of views and values, um, but if there was an active um, attempt at least to be able to embrace, to be enthusiastic about a multitude of views and values. But Joanna and I um, would say that, you know, for, for us, um, having a tolerance of these multitude of views and values um, is at least the, the minimum threshold that is required for us to have economic pluralism. And so we're obviously, you know, at a conference like this, keenly aware that there's lots of debate about what exactly is economic pluralism. You know, Dow, Kepler, Fulbrook, Caldwell have all made contributions to this, um, and we're eager to talk about it in the question and answer session if anyone uh, is interested. And then just in terms of African philosophy. Um, so, I think where African philosophy makes a really valuable contribution um, is in questioning this idea, this conception of Western rationality, this Western conception of rationality. Uh, and so, you know, rationality being so central to economics, uh, I think a really interesting example uh, is in the work of Trollson. And so Trollson takes a look at uh, 26 entrepreneurs um, in Tanzania, or entrepreneurial firms in Tanzania, and he's so astounded to um, see that despite the fact that these entrepreneurs have imported their labor-saving technology, they continue to employ family members and in many instances to the detriment um, of, of the firm in terms of it having liquidity shortages um, and seem so perplexed by this. Uh, whereas I think if one starts to begin to question what is this Western conception of rationality, 
um, this would not be seen by irrational um, for, for many uh, people uh, within South Africa. Um, and so then uh, another point where I think African philosophy is particularly strong for us to be able to draw from um, is in the work of Chimakonam, who really strongly speaks about, you know, that we have uh, sometimes um, in philosophy this, this British method almost um, of analysis, which engages really heavily in critique. Um, but Chimakonam really calls for an African philosophy that will both deconstruct and, and make no mistake, we are very eager for when we are teaching um, any type of economic pluralism to be critical, um, whether it be of the mainstream or of more heterodox traditions. But very importantly, not just to critique, not just to deconstruct, but to also reconstruct. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, allowing students to not just critique, but to be able to create their economics curricula um, in, a, in a slide or two. Uh, and so then I also just wanted to touch on this idea relating to um, decolonizing. So um, I would say that the term of decolonizing has really become a rallying point for curriculum reform. Uh, so there's also, of course, uh, a massive amount of debate in terms of debating what, how do we conceptualize uh, what it means to decolonize, how do we understand it, how do we live this out. Um, and I want to be very clear in stating that uh, we're not attempting to be prescriptive, in stating that this is the only way for us to understand and apply um, decolonizing as a process, um, but to be able to begin to engage in a dialogue about how we as economists can more actively engage with something that uh, I feel is particularly important. And so I do wanna be quite firm in, in stating that it is simply not enough to claim that we are decolonizing if we just add scholars from the Global South to our reading list. Um, that is vitally important, but we run the very real risk of this just becoming a buzzword and for it to really just be a, a hollow gesture. Um, so, you know, I would really encourage anyone that hasn't uh, to read the work of Tuck and Yang on their, their uh, article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. Um, and more recently, uh, Appleton's piece uh, that she had titled, Do Not Decolonize If You're Not Decolonizing, um, as points for us to, to really uh, reflect on. Um, and so what I would argue is that it is massively important for us to ask ourselves, what are we teaching? Who are we teaching? And how do we teach? Um, to also, I think, at least in my own attempt to be able to grapple with decolonization, to recognize that this is a process, that it is working towards something that doesn't just reach this perfect completion, and that it is indeed a lifelong commitment. Uh, and so this is a session specifically related to um, the teaching of heterodox economics. And um, so we have a focus on that, but I do want to uh, also emphasize that the economics curricula and the discussion around decolonizing is very much so embedded in institutions that need to be decolonized and that these institutions themselves are embedded in economies that need to be decolonized, which gives us a much sure. broader, thanks, uh, thanks Andrew, a much broader conception of um, what it means to decolonize. So I'm gonna uh, spend the last five minutes on this slide. So how do we reflect the lived economic realities of our students? And again, um, this is not us being prescriptive, but just uh, us having drawn from some of the work that I have presented in the past 10 minutes. So in terms of culture as a central analytical category of post-colonial thought. So in South Africa, we have something called Stockfells. So this is a savings scheme. Uh, where about 12 friends or family members will get together. Each person may put um, 500 Rand um, aside in a month, and then one person will get, you know, 6,000 Rand in a month, and it'll rotate on a monthly basis, very much so based on a culture of trust. And so um, Lingholo talks about uh, Stockfeld in her book where, are, where she is attempting to report on figures and estimates of how many South Africans are part of Stockfeld's of which in a population of 58 million people, the estimates are we have 11.4 million people part of Stockfells, um, and an estimate of 44 billion rand per year that is saved in, in Stockfells or used for investment. Um, and my frustration in this, and please, I would be eager if anyone else um, who is part of the participants or the panelists has managed to find this, but I can't find something relating to Stockfells in a single South African economics textbook um, or anyone devoting a serious amount of time to this in their economics curricula in South Africa. Um, 
And what frustrates me is that this is actually how saving and investment happens for the overwhelming majority of South Africans, not through the formal financial institutions. Um, and so uh, part of a, a example uh, that I would, I would draw on to, to kind of attempt to illustrate what do I mean when I say that we don't reflect the lived economic realities of our students in our curriculum. So, um, of course, uh, exposure to different schools of thought is massively important, but it simply isn't enough, which is why we think using post-colonial thought as a cross-cutting frame is really valuable. Um, and certainly that when we are teaching a Marxist, ecological, post-Keynesian, feminist approach to economics, that we make sure that we embed it in a historical understanding, that it's contextualized and applied to the African context. And then very importantly, in closing, to not just talk about deconstructing, but to construct, to ask ourselves, are our students co-creators in their curriculum? So my students, as an example, get to literally choose one of the themes that we are going to be um, discussing throughout the semester. Um, and at the beginning of the semester, I invite them to look at the other themes that I have suggested and to tell me whether they think they're actually useful or relevant um, for them. And so when students then choose one of their own themes, um, it is up to them to gather, synthesize, and evaluate their own learning resources for them to then present it. Uh, I encourage my students to also choose an assessment method where they get to de decide how they want to be assessed. Um, and so when we're finally also thinking through Sabelun Lobukhacheni's work of, you know, calling not just for us to think about knowledge, but knowledge is, um, I, I think it's important for us to ask who gets invited into our classroom. Uh, are we inviting someone with PhDs from Oxford, Harvard, Yale, and Stanford? Uh, but why not, for example, an informal trader? Um, what is it that we conceive of as knowledge, particularly within economics? And so then, literally in the last 10 seconds of closing, um, instead of the question and answer session necessarily being questions posed at us, where we are these founts of knowledge, to really, I think, hopefully uh, attempt to encapsulate knowledges. I would love to hear from academics, students that may be um, part of the participants, what are your lived experiences of, of teaching economics? And I would really love to hear your stories um, in an attempt for us to break down this idea of just knowledge, uh, but rather to, to really begin to grapple with the idea of knowledges. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Michelle, and uh, uh, for being prompt and also prompting us to uh, come up with our own ideas and, and contribute, rather than expecting to be entertained, by us, which, which would inevitably disappoint, be disappointing. Um, the the Q&A, as I say, there is the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the screen. If you could put uh, any questions in there, we will, uh, the, the speakers will answer them uh, towards the end. Or as Michelle said, you can put your thoughts in there and the speakers may be able to respond to those. Um, so our, we're going to jump across the South Atlantic uh, now uh, to uh, Colombia. Uh, our next speaker, Juan David Para. Are you uh, ready, Juan? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, uh, after you. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for everyone for being here to allow me sharing some ideas about the qualitative course in, uh, that I've been teaching in the Master of Economics at Universidad Norte. And the argument that I have here is that basically a qualitative research like brings an opportunity and qualitative teaching brings an opportunity to introduce heterodoxy into a classroom by making students like aware of uh, the need to bring different explanations into their theories. Uh, the, the, the motivation emerges from perhaps Chang's uh, definition of pluralism, uh, according to which uh, no theory is good at explaining everything and recognizing uh, the importance of uh, bringing different theories by recognizing that each of them has strengths and weaknesses. I think that this also echoes the voice of Stilwell when he warns us that heterodoxy and pluralism are not synonymous. And with this, he's trying to say to us that we should not fall into that money trap of trying to simply expose our own preferred alternative to orthodoxy in the classroom. If the idea is here to understand real problems, perhaps uh, it's wise not to simply impose uh, an alternative framework, but to try to figure out how to uh, combine frameworks in a way that it helps us to better understand uh, reality. 
What is the challenge here? Of course, uh, the dominance of a single view in classical economics. We are, I think that uh, people here in this forum are, are aware of many of these critiques. So that must be challenged. Uh, it's problematic. Uh, there's a neoliberal ontology that I, I relate to an extreme individualistic uh, way of seeing uh, the uh, economic theory. And of course, the challenge here is that this has created a, a, a new common sense that is very much encrypted into the mindsets of policymakers, students. So uh, we have to address this common sense to be able to, to, to invite more people to become interested in exploring alternative theories. And uh, of course, this comes for, from Andrew and, when, and his colleagues, uh, when he also tells us that it's necessary and important that students are not exposed to concepts that are too far outside from their proximal zone of development. And here, the, the, the thing is that we should not overwhelm students because if we try to, to, to introduce lots of theories at the same time, uh, we are not going to really motivate them to, to move into a new uh, framework, but perhaps they're going to keep the one in which they uh, feel more comfortable that it's perhaps the mainstream. Uh, what is my proposal? So basically, as, it, as the course is about qualitative research, uh, taking into uh, taking the advantage that there's a growing interest of mainstream economics in qualitative research, I think it represents like an opportunity for conveys to students the, the importance of exploring explanations. Uh, here, for example, in the literature of impact evaluation, uh, mainstream economists have recognized explicitly that they need qualitative research to open the black box of, of different processes. And this, of course, is an opportunity that we have to take uh, into account. Uh, I also assume that economists are more open to causal qualitative research. I mention this because uh, we are also aware that there are lots of uh, approaches to qualitative research. Some of them that don't recognize causality are not interested in causality. Uh, and I think that we should embrace one that, is, that, that embraces causality because economists are usually interested in causality. And I think that this is compatible with the view of critical realism. Basically, because critical realism as a paradigm, uh, as, an, uh, as an ontology, and as an epistemology is interested in testing theories, that that's part of the thing that we want to do. And also, it involves a, a language like a structures, regularities, the irregularities, that I feel that might result comfortable to students of economics. So I think that building that bridge uh, through critical realism uh, brings that uh, the potential that we want to, that we are looking for. Uh, what are my arguments to students? And of course, these previous arguments are arguments in my mind, but I have also to persuade the students to become more interested in qualitative research. So these are some of the things that I tell them in the class. First, uh, that life is complex, but also to recognize that models, even mainstream models, are attempts to grasp complexity. So here, recognizing that knowing models is important to study reality. Uh, and when I talk about complexity, I try to, to tell them that things happen because people make decisions that depend on how they understand the context they inhabit and how they interact with other people. Meaning that reality is complex because it's full of interactions that have unintended outcomes, unintended consequences. And we have to do something to, to, to engage into the study of this complexity. Uh, and in understanding this complexity and, and the role of different methods, Measurement in quantitative research, for example, econometrics, I tell them that is useful or can be useful to measure some of the results of those complexities. But of course, uh, we, we have to grasp other social processes that we cannot simply measure. So here we need qualitative research to study the unknown, the unobserved. And uh, I think that this starts also bringing that uh, potentiality into the minds of the students. And uh, also telling them that qualitative research doesn't need to be so messy or that messy. And here I'm also having like a critique to other overviews that I think that make qualitative research overwhelmingly uh, messy uh, and confusing. And here I'm also stepping on a, on a critique to induction that exists in the literature that, uh, because lots of qualitative research is inductive. And so I start presenting alternative concepts such, such as abduction and retroduction that I think that are going to be important for them to, to understand, to be able to advance in the goals of the course. Uh, but of course, these are uh, concepts that are abstract uh, from, the, from philosophy of science. So I also need the strategies to, to help them to, to introduce these concepts to students. So here I'm using the resources from uh, pedagogical resources, such as, for example, the screening movies, motion pictures. So I first use, for example, this scene from Stranger Things, a very popular TV show in Netflix. And this situation is very interesting because these two guys, Jonathan and Nancy, 
and trying to figure out how are they going to find the monster that took their friend. And they are trying to realize how to create a strategy to arrive to, a, to the answer of where is the monster. And they started like to look in at different theories. Eventually they arrived to the theory that the monster might be a predator, so he likes blood. And eventually they create a strategy, they pour blood somewhere and the monster appears. So this is like this idea that abduction uh, is about creative thinking to, to bring different theories into, into the table and to create hypotheses based on those theories. And then retroduction is the idea of testing those theories. So uh, uh, then I present them uh, another counterexample that contact, uh, there's another famous movie uh, with Jodie Foster who plays as Dr. Arway. And in this scene, uh, I claim that it's happening lots of induction that is problematic. They are trying to figure out uh, the meaning of some signals that are arriving from outer space. And so they start, uh, start trying to guess out of the empirical da data what's going on. So if, it's, if, if there are say, signals coming from uh, certain stars and certain galaxy, et cetera. And as you can see the scene and then read the, this slide, uh, the, the conclusion is that they didn't arrive to any answer. So here is also to convey to students why also using pure induction is problematic. And if we jump away from induction, we can uh, build a strategy that is also familiar to the type of reasoning that the students of economics usually uh, uh, engage into. Then I present them like a, a, an applied work that is going to serve as an example for a class project that, I'm, that I give them afterwards. So this is a study that I think that puts abduction and retroduction in place. So basically they said these authors I say are, are studying uh, education systems in Latin America. So what they do first is to try to understand the different outcomes of the systems uh, that are um, designed to, 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 to function as uh, education quasi markets. So they bring a uh, mainstream theory uh, from public choice theory. They map those theories, they build concept maps, and then they elucidate the assumptions behind those theories. Uh, and put them like very straightforward. And after that, they create a strategy based on qualitative research to then go and test that theory with, uh, with case studies and eventually refine those theories and bring a, a more nuanced and, and, and possibly more uh, rich understanding of the specific problematic. So uh, this is very important because it's recognizing that you have to start from a theory that maybe you already know or you already handle, uh, recognize those assumptions and then go and try to see if those assumptions hold in reality. So what's the class project about? Basically, I start asking them, okay, what's your research questions? So I am I assume here, and I know that they are working on their MA thesis, so I can take advantage of that. What are the economic theories that are you're using? They can be either mainstream or non-mainstream, but I'm guessing that most of them are going to be mainstream because of the context in which they are learning economics. So bring your theories and then represent those theories in a concept map. And they, very importantly in that concept map, the idea here is to start identifying the many assumptions that link eventually X and Y that are probably the two variables that they're going to insert in an econometric model. So this way of thinking is going to help them to open up or start opening up the theory that they have to start scrutinizing that theory and eventually arriving to questions about that theory. And then I ask them to plan an interview with key informant that they select, uh, 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 one that is easy for them to get in the, in the, in the term of the course, and then uh, uh, undertake an interview and present the results uh, based on the analysis of the interview and other references that they may find. You have five minutes. Okay, great. Uh, uh, for then afterwards, after having like all of this uh, background, uh, we can, I claim to students that we can start solving many of the issues that are very problematic or very fuzzy in, in qualitative research, even for experienced qualitative researchers. So uh, I, I hear you use critical realism again to tell them that the idea, what they have to, that what they try, what they are trying to do with their research design is basically trying to test their theory. So this is our help. This helps us start solving some some issues. So so who to talk with? So this is about something depends on your theory. So of course you have to talk and talk to people that are relevant to uh, refine your theory. What should I ask? Well, that depends on your theory. And then we can, we here introduce, for example, realist interviews that are very uh, explicit and have lots of uh, strategies to address this type of interviews to, to refine theories. How to analyze information? Well, you already know, <laughs> depends on your theory. Then here we introduce coding and other strategies and uh, narratives, etc but always like keeping in, uh, in mind the umbrella of that theory that is the final goal for them to try to, to refine and come to an answer. 
And how to validate findings? Well, you already know, <laughs> depends on your theory. And here I, for example, introduce some of, of the arguments of, of validity, external validity, and qualitative research, like theoretical validity by Maxwell, that also helps them uh, to, 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 to bring like awareness of the rigor of their work. Because one of the challenges here is of course that a lot of students from economics believe that doing quantitative research is doing rigorous research, but doing qualitative research is doing non-rigorous research. But with these types of arguments, I try to claim to, to convey them that they can do and they must do a, a, a rigorous qualitative research. Uh, so what are the next steps in the class? So this is where my class ends. And as you can see so far, so, so far I have not spoken during the class about heterodoxy per se, but because my initial claim is that I want to bring a, build a bridge for the students to eventually become interested in exploring alternative theories. So uh, when they're presenting, I basically uh, pose them some, some questions. Did you find useful talking to someone about your project? And this, is, uh, this, this sounds like very basic, but lots of my students that uh, have never spoken with anyone in terms of doing research. So they start also finding that when they go and speak with someone, that's very important even for their quantitative modeling and also for opening new types of questions. What else do you need to answer your questions? So also this idea to start refining a theory and to start advancing in, in, in identifying new elements to bring into those theories. Uh, and of course, uh, always informed by the idea of the theory of abduction and reproduction. Uh, then I, I asked them, was, was your initial theory good enough to address your research question? And very importantly, to what extent it was and it wasn't, here recognizing that mainstream theories also bring some uh, tools, important tools to be able to address search, uh, certain aspects of the questions, but also to uh, uh, inviting them to start problematizing the framework that they brought initially, and this to start to help them connect to the idea of eventually finding a new framework. And finally, what other economic theories might be useful to address your research questions? And this, of course, they don't do it in my class, but I think that, or I argue, that this is a way of also addressing that risk that I mentioned before of not overwhelming students. I don't want to just go into a class and teach every single economic theory that exists, but perhaps if we start by certain theories uh, based on, in, on particular topics of research, then the students are going to go through a theory, deconstruct that theory, analyze that theory, uh, uh, become aware of possible limitations of the theory and how they're going to choose new theories. Well, they can then go and explore uh, how heterodox, heterodox thinkers have addressed similar topics as they, have, uh, as they are trying to address in their research. And I think this brings like a very nice connection to that idea of uh, becoming aware that there, are, that there are alternative explanations and alternative explanations not for the sake of simply exploring other theories, but for the sake of understanding a particular problem. So this is also important because the students, uh, some of the claims is that if they, if they study a heterodox series, they're not going to find a job, they're not going to be good policy analysts, they're not going to, et cetera, et cetera. But with these types of arguments, what I'm trying to, to, to claim is all the opposite. If you bring a heterodox theories with certain uh, structure and order and design, uh, then you're going to be able to, to get even uh, more analytic tools to be able to grasp complexity and reality and become a better analyst. And that's all. And that, that is uh, absolutely perfect timing. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, Great. Again, a really, really interesting talk. Um, pleased to see some colleagues from uh, Leeds quoted there, Nick Emmel, uh, um, for instance. Uh, and also pleased to see some really interesting methodological discussion. And it's worth mentioning now that the AHE has funded uh, over, the many, over many years, hundreds of students to go through uh, advanced research methods training in exactly that kind of topic and it, it, it's uh, one of the one of the key things the AHE does and if you want to support that kind of thing you might consider joining or even donating to the association um, so thanks again Juan uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Daniele and she's speaking she's presenting a paper on behalf of herself and a couple of other people who are insignificant um, so if you're ready Danny Yes, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for, for having me in the session. So the paper that I'm presenting is Do Heterodox Economists Teach Differently? A Contrastive Evaluation of Interview Data. So this, oops, 
Yeah, it's working out. Um, so this is coming from a project that um, derives essentially from a book that myself, Andrew Mierman and Sebastian Berger published last year. And the question about teaching came as an underlying question to our project. Um, and it's very, I would say, very, um, it fits very well to the debate that we're having now, not just the old calls of change uh, to economics education that came from the financial crisis, but also for some of the calls that will likely uh, we'll see more uh, with the, the COVID crisis that will ask for a more multidimensional form of economics education, which is more rooted in everyday practice and power relations. So one area of heterodoxy that we want to explore further is the teaching. So we see that there's a massive gap in the literature about this and if heterodox economists uh, teach differently or not. So this comes from our um, project with um, interviews with leading economists, leading heterodox economists. So we had uh, 16 semi-structured interviews with, um, these, with this sample. We have um, a quite good mix in terms of geography, gender, school of thought or approach, focus on what they do in terms of research. These are all more senior heterodox economists and more professorial level. Um, here we applied the principles of thematic analysis and I'll go through the, the main themes that emerged in, in our analysis in a minute. And we want to, with, with this project, we want to illuminate the main, the main question. So what is heterodox econ economics, but also to go into a few underlying themes and that's where the teaching came out as, a, as an important theme that also help us to understand the nature of heterodox economics. So is there a heterodox approach to teaching? So here we want to, uh, answer three main questions. So first, how different is heterodox economists thinking on teaching in comparison to the mainstream? So how they understand and how they conceive the teaching and how this compares with mainstream economists? Which ele elements make a heterodox approach to teaching? So is there something that we can draw there, a common approach? Um, are there any implications for the broader economics education in this sense? And uh, what does a heterodox approach to teaching tell us about the broader nature of heterodox economics? So maybe we can draw um, some, some insights that can help us also to understand what heterodox economics is, which we know is a very complex thing. So if we go in the teaching and learning education literature, so going into the, the background of this. So I like to think about teaching and learning in education as being uh, represented by a tree so that the, the roots of the tree are the educational goals. So why are we teaching the students that? So what is our purpose with this? Are we looking for a more uh, instrumental form of education? So do we want just students to master certain concepts and techniques? Or do we want students to be empowered in a more critical pedagogy way? Or are we just addressing a more liberal education uh, that we want students to be able to develop, um, to be able to become a, autonomous thinkers and analytical thinkers. So we also can think about um, what we're teaching, so how we can um, shape the content based on our educational goals. Also, how we're going to teach. So here we focus a lot on the process, so the techniques, um, more teaching resources, if it's data-driven or not, so how do we engage that teaching. And finally, we can think about um, issues in efficacy. So how we're going to verify if students can or cannot accomplish certain things in the end. So with, with this tree in terms of teaching learning, um, two main things come out of this. So we, when we think about instrumental education, we're focusing very much on the process. So how we're teaching. And for instance, when we consider more a uh, liberal approach to education is that, that we want students to become this autonomous thinker and be able to think for themselves. We're very much focusing on first, the goals, right? So what we want them uh, to achieve in the end and how we're going to adjust the content so we are able to achieve that in the end. So to some extent, also the what, the liberal education. So what we're going to see here in the literature about mainstream uh, teaching of economics and heterodox teaching of economics is that we have somehow this division between instrumental education and liberal education. Instrumental education more found in the mainstream approach to teaching and uh, a somehow unconscious approach 
to, to teaching to, in heterodoxy more towards a liberal education. So going into the literature, first about the mainstream approach to teaching of economics. So what do we have as, as evidence? So here essentially we have um, evidence in terms of the intellectual definition of the mainstream. So we know that this is mainly instrumental. So there's a lot of focus on process, like I said, on how you teach. So usually focusing on how we uh, make students more engaged or how we teach with more data driven uh, approaches, how we improve our teaching resources. Uh, and here uh, applying the mainstream theory. And we also know that the mainstream approach to teaching of economics uh, has um, an important sociological consideration as well. So we, we, we know that there's a committee on economics education that is um, a, a branch of the American Economics Association. There's also a journal of economics education. And the, the main idea that uh, drives from the mainstream approach is that we want to train the next generation um, reproduce the mainstream concepts and maintain the structures. Okay, so uh, we want to ensure that the, the concepts are, are just reproduced. Uh, the evidence with the literature. So here we, we can use, for instance, the biographies of mainstream economists, uh, interviews. So there are several books published with uh, interviews with mainstream economists, uh, one by Baumaker in 2010. Uh, asking questions about how mainstream economists teach. And we can see that they're much less concerned with liberal education. Of course, we know that there is a few exceptions, uh, but mostly focusing on instrumental approach. There is some focus on content, so the what we teach, uh, what they teach, uh, but more in terms of breadth versus depth. So we want to ensure that you teach a lot of concepts rather than focusing on, on just a few. And we can see that since uh, the 2008 crisis, there has been some marginal changes. So there is um, some attempt to incorporate new concepts, make um, deal with engagement issues and ensure that the material is much more data driven. Uh, but in terms of uh, pluralism and an actual change of, of the theories and what is being taught, so the, the content, we know that there has been marginal changes. So in terms of the heterodoxy approach to teaching, uh, the literature does not identify uh, a single heterodox approach to teach and learning, but we can see several interventions from heterodox economists uh, in the pedagogy. So usually this heterodox approach focuses on two things. So first the content, so what heterodox economists are teaching. Usually this is challenging the mainstream canon with contending perspectives and also greater pluralism in terms of the content and also the process of how you're going to do and present this to students. Uh, the idea here behind uh, the heterodox approach is that economists, they need a bigger toolbox for this. Uh, and this will lead to more open-mindedness and to uh, tolerance so that students can have an idea of how different approaches work and coexist. And this will develop a key, key cognitive skills. There is more concern with liberal education from the literature um, and also, uh, many heterodox economists emphasize the issue of critical and ra radical pedagogy. So drawing here from, from Freire and how students can be more empowered with this approach. So with the insights from the interviews, uh, I'll go through this quickly, but of course we can uh, discuss this a little bit more uh, in, during the, the Q&A session. So our purpose is simple with senior heterodox economists, different approaches and traditions, um, the topic of economics education and how they teach was part of, of the questionnaire and this became an important theme in the analysis. We had a few a priori expectations. So the explicit attention to education of uh, philosophy, um, if they exhibit um, some concern and some, some understanding of either liberal or critical pedagogy, and perhaps that they are showing some understanding of learning. So this is what we expected in the first place. And three main themes came out of the analysis. So first, influences of uh, experiences and teachers, so past experiences and teachers, range of educational goals, and third, and perhaps most importantly, a commitment to pluralism. So I'll go through these three themes. We have five minutes. 
Yeah, so first the influences of experiences and teachers. So there is some overlap here with the mainstream. They all, always emphasize, yes, it's important um, to be good teachers and good content, but not as much as the mainstream. So here uh, the heterodoxy is more attracted on teachers who embrace open mindedness, critical questioning of ideas and engagement with debates. Uh, this may be, of course, because of some uh, personal back, uh, previous experiences, so generation. Some people here come from the generation of 68, so they're very politically engaged. For family influences, social, social class, religion. Uh, but also, and more importantly, two things here. Early exposure to certain uh, traits and structural features of teaching. So, for instance, um, Sharushila says, uh, that reading the originals and not just the usual suspects um, like Keynes, Marx was important. Um, also, Fernando Carvalho, Cardin, says uh, it was important for us to see heated debates between teachers and see how they engaged in that. The same with Sheila Dow saying uh, it's not about fisticuffs, but it's about engaged debate and how ideas flow. So this was a, an important thing. And also the negative experiences with the mainstream content. So um, like Vit says, had a hard time to find it interesting, little connection with the real world, and having teachers who would actually challenge this content was a massive influence. Number two with educational philosophy and goals. So here, the mainstream literature, of course, reveals a more instrumental approach. So learning for most mainstream economists in, in the literature means learning is about mastering concepts and techniques that students were told to do. In the contrary, heterodox teachers, they have elements of critical pedagogy. So they want, this is a, the goal, right? So the why teach, empower students to debate others. Liberal pedagogy, so they want students to be self-reliant, able enough um, and confident to think for themselves. And also educational goals in terms of open-mindedness, thinking independently about the world and transmitting a good understanding of real world economic problems. And also we see that some heterodox economists they have an understanding of how learning occurs. So bringing the concept of Bildung, for instance, when compared to the mainstream. In some cases, this is unconscious, but we can see this reflects on the teaching educational goals and philosophy. Finally, and maybe I'll just wrap up here, in terms of pluralism. So pluralism was the main theme that came out from our interviews. Here we mean, uh, of course, pluralism in teaching, not necessarily pluralism in economics, even though Many of our interviewees, they came from a specific school of thought and they did research in a certain approach or branch. Uh, pluralism in teaching was very important for them and for uh, these teachers to show students how it's important for you to have these contending approaches. So here we can see the clear contrast from the mainstream interviews. There is no or very little implementation of this in, in teaching and in heterodox teaching this came out of how they implement this pluralism is very context dependent and um, in terms of answering practical questions. So, for instance, um, inequalities, so ethnicity, gender, um, development, global south versus global north. And also they saw pluralism um, in terms of better science, understanding how power influences economic knowledge and also how teaching at least one non-neoclassical perspective was very important for them, for them, for these teachers to have this contrasting approach, also linking to educational goals. Okay, so I guess I only have a minute left, so I'll briefly go to the conclusions here. So uh, pluralism within, within teaching and a commitment to pluralism within economics, key theme here, pluralism for heterodox perspective of teaching. Uh, the heterodox economics pedagogy, so so it has some elements of a liberal approach to teaching. We want autonomous critical thinkers, although unconscious at times. Uh, this, given the current context of how more likely we will have new calls for reform in, in economics education, this seems better suited to address the challenges and response to these demands uh, for change. And um, also, this seems um, a relatively better fit for the new teachers training environment in higher education. So if we want teachers to have a formal training, um, having a heterodox approach to, to pedagogy can ensure that these teachers have um, a better perspective of, of real world economic problems. 
And then finally, this shows that a pedagogy of heterodox economics still can thrive in a hier hierarchical discipline. Uh, we know that many interviewees said that in some cases they paid a high price for this in their careers. But it shows that heterodox economics pedagogy is successful, but it still needs to work further to establish templates for their approach and also for this to be passed on further. So for us to have more materials on heterodox economic uh, pedagogy and also for this to be more disseminated within the heterodox networks. So I hope I didn't went, didn't go too much beyond the time. Well, a little bit, yeah, uh, don't do it again. Okay. Thank you very much, Danny. Again, well, I, I would say that was great, obviously. Um, I'm biased. Um, so thank you for questions coming in. There are, uh, there are the panelists can respond to them. I, I just responded to one. Um, if you have a question uh, for, for the panelists or a comment for the panelists, put that in the Q&A box. If you have a technical question, uh, put that in the uh, chat box. Uh, we have one more uh, presentation and then we'll have a, a, a general Q&A. So uh, the final uh, presentation is by John Homos. Um, are you ready, John? Yes, here I am. Thank you. Okay, over to you. Uh, let's see. I think uh, economics is on the wrong track. So my talk is basically about uh, the problems with mainstream economics. And uh, I call it blackboard economics as a uh, kind of pejorative uh, way of referring to it because I think that their models work on the blackboards, the problem is uh, that it doesn't work in the uh, real world. And many of our problems today, or most of our problems today from globalization to crises of all sorts, I think can be traced back to uh, the problems of mainstream economics. So the question is, why does uh, the economy not work like it uh, does on the blackboard? And uh, I refer to problems with, uh, with uh, the mainstream, uh, which uh, kind of emphasizes how efficiently markets work. And in, in, in contrast, I emphasize the Achilles heels of markets, that is to say their weaknesses or why are they uh, inefficient unless uh, they're carefully uh, regulated. Uh, and uh, I name quite a few Achilles heels and one is information uh, because uh, information is a big uh, big issue in economics and it's usually overlooked uh, in the mainstream. Information is costly and not free. And in this, uh, that kind of a situation, uh, markets tend to be inefficient. So that should be the default uh, model that markets are generally inefficient uh, sometimes they are close to being an eff efficient, but it's rather the exception rather than the rule. There's a lot of opportunistic behavior in the real world, and that's uh, also missing from the mainstream. Free markets open up a whole bunch of possibilities for people to take advantage of other people in an immoral or deceptive manner. Uh, third, people are not rational. To start economics by assuming that people are rational is a non-starter. I think that uh, Daniel Kahneman would agree with that. So that I emphasize the pre-Freudian nature of uh, mainstream economics. And I also emphasize that it's pre-Pavlovian. So it's basically pre-20th century ideas. Uh, I believe that rationality is impossible with finite minds. Pavlovian conditioning is uh, very important. Uh, today, we use drugs so much that uh, we've come close to the brave new world of Aldous Huxley. 
The cognitive endowment of people is uh, normally distributed, so that uh, needs to be taken into consideration. Makes exploitation possible uh, by the uh, smart people who can take advantage of uh, people who are less educated or less skilled or that sort of thing. Children are disregarded in most cases. Uh, so I refer to mainstream economics as adult economics. Uh, conditioning begins at birth, and that's something uh, to keep in mind, because that makes taste endogenous. Okay, very important. The assumption that tastes are exogenous is, is actually very detrimental to understanding economic processes because uh, we need to be protected from uh, concentrations of power in Madison Avenue and Wall Street, Hollywood, Silicon Valley. All this needs to be taken into consideration. Relative incomes matter a lot. Absolute income also in order to meet basic needs, but thereafter relative income is what drives uh, people's uh, relationship to the society and to the political processes. So growing the economy is not a prescription for well-being because uh, it's, it's the latter uh, that matters a lot. Uh, methodological individualism is a problem because society is omitted in the textbook. Uh, you just have individuals like uh, Robinson Crusoe's uh, very tiny bit of interaction in the real, in, in uh, contrast to the real world. Uh, mainstream forgets that concentration of wealth leads to concentration of power, and not only economic power, but political power. And that's how democracy is being threatened. We are morphing into an oligarchy and a plutocracy, very problematic. Uncertainty, uh, in the midst of a COVID uh, pandemic, I don't have to emphasize uh, the, the great importance of uncertainty. Non-existent markets are overlooked. Uh, these pose serious challenges to our very existence because future generations are unable to bid for today's resources. Setting limits is difficult in free markets, unable to control fast food industry, obesity epidemic, we all know about that. Uh, indebtedness, we know all about that. Intangibles are difficult to price. Safety, risk, uh, global warming, that sort of thing. Uh, externalities have to be taken into consideration. Justice, morality, ethics are neglected in the mainstream. So that's that's an important uh, important uh, concept because uh, the mainstreams uh, assume or or suggest that uh, they are objective, but how can you be objective if you believe that uh, your your uh, your values are such that uh, you value efficiency. Well, why value efficiency more than you value uh, morality or justice? Okay, where does that come from? Uh, the perfectly competitive model on which uh, ACOM 101 concentrate is really anachronistic. You, you got to really uh, concentrate on oligopolies and monopolies, which are generally given short shrift in uh, principles of economics courses. Time is a crucial element of uh, economic processes, which is almost completely overlooked. 
it's a problem of sequential choice and path dependence has to be emphasized. That's the 16th Achilles heel, 17th. Government is not a boogeyman. Taxes do not produce that way losses if they're invested properly. And uh, that's very important, not only in terms of providing education, infrastructure, and basic research, so, and oversight, regulation. Government is often made out to just be interfering in the economy. In some real markets, as opposed to imaginary ones are rarely efficient. In some blackboard economics comes up short. It is on the wrong track. The inconvenient truth is that mainstream economics like uh, Marty Feldstein are the fundamental cause of the rise of right wing pluralism. You have five minutes. Inconvenient truth number two, bad blackboard economists failed to see the financial crisis coming. What good are they? If uh, Bernanke comes out with the great moderation in 2004 and three years uh, later, uh, the world uh, goes berserk. Uh, blackboard economists did not see the risk of hyperglobalization. Mainstream economists predicted that GDP growth would be good for us, and instead it gave us 150,000 deaths of despair in the U.S. alone, never mind the COVID virus. Even before that, we were in deep trouble. The regulation had precisely the opposite effect from the one predicted by blackboard economists. Economists condone an obscene level of inequality that has destabilized the socio-political system and is threatening democracy itself. Blackboard economists are clueless on how to get out of the Trump recession. In other words, markets are not made in heaven. They are man-made institutions and they have to be analyzed in terms of the real world. Humans are not economic agents. Homo economicus is not a superman or superwoman. Okay, we need a new paradigm and I call it humanistic economics. And I write about it in my textbook if you're interested in exploring it further. Otherwise, you can contact me at your convenience anytime. I'm maybe a couple of minutes early spoke a little fast. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, John. And, and again, nobody has to apologize for finishing within time. <laughs> so if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, we'll get everybody else back on the screen visible. Um, and then we can go to some of the many really interesting questions that we've had in the, in the Q and A box. Um, I can see that um, some of our speakers have offered to uh, answer particular questions. So let, uh, what I suggest is that we deal with those first, and then we then we look at some of the wider questions as well that have come up. Because I think many of the questions do um, do apply to everybody, and so we could we can see which ones we will. I'll have a look, see which ones we think we need to answer. You can also feed in. I'm afraid, Michelle, we haven't had many people uh, offering their thoughts, so we we are going to have to be the the fonts of knowledge. I'm afraid. Um, First question that, that got asked was uh, by uh, Rudy, and Michelle, you said you wanted to answer this question live. Uh, and Rudy uh, writes as an educator in African University, noting a tension uh, between the students seeing African pluralist content as inferior, because their lived experience is often that, uh, when, when working for an in international organization or presenting more, more broadly. Um, is there a risk uh, that, that we, are we prioritizing decolonization of their mind, et cetera? So, Michelle, do you want to address that question? Yeah, uh, so, so I think really the, the crux of Rudy's question is how he phrases it, where he, he asks, do we therefore prioritize the decolonization of their minds and potentially risk them not getting international employment or vice versa? Uh, and so I think that that is a binary that gets created in the students' minds. 
Um, and if we're going to really at attempt to begin to grapple with what economic pluralism is about, it's that we don't need to choose either or, right? Um, so it's it's not a case of well we're we're teaching you a heterodox economics or a decolonized African version of heterodox economics and we're not even touching on the mainstream right so obviously there's much debate about pluralism um, but I think that we would be doing students an injustice to only be teaching them um, a Africanized version of heterodox economics is, is the most extreme form right and um, and so there's lots of debates then and, and this is the last I'll say on this that well there just isn't enough time enough um, class hours uh, enough attention span from students um, and I just don't buy that uh, so I think that if we are explicit with our students and explaining to them this is what the mainstream is uh, we're teaching you this I want you to be critical of it this is an at least an alternative approach and I want you to be critical of that um, and be explicit about how knowledge is produced and disseminated. Um, my students are happy to stay in class for four or five hours, right? Because I'm explicit in explaining to them, even though it's unfair, um, you need to do both. You need to be better than the economist who's only going to be taught the mainstream, right? So I don't think we need to do one or the other. I think we can do both. That's uh, thank you. You've fed into the uh, a couple of questions that we've had from the from the attendees about exactly what you just raised about where do you fit these alternative perspectives in? So uh, Oleg asked, this was to Daniela, but I think anybody can answer this. He says, uh, bigger toolbox within the same time span, at what cost? Mm -hmm. So who wants to answer, who wants to have a go at that? Uh, Ankush also asks a question about on breadth versus depth. Um, and where you know what is there a trade-off or is the trade-off artificial or and if there are trade-offs where where would you make them Any, anybody anybody jump in there well i, I guess uh, my response would be that uh, we have to not think of the tra trade-off we have to think of uh, of uh, making sure that the students understand how e economy, the economy works, right? So we cannot present the mainstream without uh, presenting the criticisms to the mainstream, can we? If you want to be uh, truthful to the students. Hmm. Anybody else? Can, Danny, I you jump, can I jump in? Hmm. Um, I have to agree with what was said. I don't think, I think this is, the trade-off is a fallacy. I don't think it exists, either yeah, A or B. Yeah. It doesn't. Um, I think that we, we first, we, we need to design the curriculum into the sense that we want to think about the educational goals and philosophy, right? What do we want students to achieve in the end? And of course, that we want a, a breadth of, of um, skills and, and techniques. And of course, the technical knowledge is important. But at the same time, we also want students to understand and apply that to the real world and understand the problems of what we see in, in reality, right? It's like Michelle said, and it's like Juan said, it's not that um, decolonial theory should be taught in this corner or qualitative methods is just useful for this or that. It needs to be embedded within the curriculum. So I think this also opens the door for more cross um, units or cross modules collaborations work in bigger projects on where you have topics such as inequality or um, COVID-19 climate crisis etc and this would these different technical skills and methods and approaches would be helpful for you to understand these problems. Uh if I can jump in just very shortly, Andrew, uh, sure. just to, to emphasize what Danielle is saying, in just very pragmatic terms, um, I think sometimes we expect the way up for breadth versus depth to be how many hours do we have in the class, what can we test and assess students on, and I think we need to, to rethink our role as academics, right? So it is a case of, I want to give you a a plethora of readings, of blog posts, of tweets, of people that we're inviting into the classroom where knowledge is relayed verbally and not just in written texts. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to kind of map out where are further avenues for exploration. And even though I only have X amount of time and tests or essays or presentations that you can make, I have given you the opportunity as a student to further explore that. And for our students to give us the opportunity as educators to say, well, 
you know, this is where I think we need to have further discussions where I, as your student, can teach you as an educator something else, right? So it's about exposure um, and then letting them discover further and letting ourselves discover further. There's a really, thanks Rochelle, there's a really interesting question from Stefania uh, um, who links to Rudy's question that we've already talked about um, and about what to teach and what the limits are and what to teach um, and says it's not just about institutional constraints somehow but also uh, resistance to change from students that students may be, uh, can be quite conservative uh, in wanting a, a simplified curriculum perhaps wanting clear answers. Um, how do you, have you experienced that in your teaching? And, and if so, how have you dealt with that? Anybody? Well, I, I think it would be a mistake to uh, cater to the taste of students. You know, students may well believe in uh, the beauty of comparative advantage. They might have heard about the uh, beauty of uh, international trade and how everybody benefits. Well, that's fine, but I think it behooves us to point out that it, the, the limitations of those models, right? And I think it uh, is our responsibility to show, uh, to show the students then how that mainstream idea has led to all sorts of problems with people who have lost jobs and uh, created an a, a political atmosphere, uh, which ultimately led to uh, Trumpism. So that it's, it's important to widen, in my opinion, and uh, to widen the uh, students' horizons. Does anybody else want to come in, in, in on that? Because uh, um, Juan, I, I, I noted that you talked about um, needing to understand how much complexity a, a, a student would be happy with, uh, what is an appropriate challenge for them, what is, what is, what is be, you know, not beyond is the wrong expression, but what is, if, if you give them too much of a challenge, you're going to scare them away. Um, there was a question that I think you offered to talk to anyway from uh, Carlos uh, about falling into the trap of introducing the economy students concepts and practices that aim to create awareness towards complexity but don't truly engage in structural transformation so um, they're almost there's a balance there between complexity and, and activism but also you you, re, you talked about complexity and giving people a challenge uh, but making that making that possible for the students making it accessible for the students Yes, of course, I think that, uh, of course, we, all, we are all talking from different contexts. And my context is for very particular, a particular one, Colombia, very close to the United States, very close to neoliberalism and all of the implication that is, that's going to bring in the education. Of we seem to have a temporary loss of Juan there. So um, I don't know whether, Danny, you wanted to comment on this issue about um, how to engage with the students. I mean, John was very much of the view that we shouldn't necessarily go to exactly where the students are, but I think, you know, Michelle was offering a slightly different view. I don't know whether, whether what, what your position is. And, and how do you encounter, have you encountered resistance to pluralism in teaching? And if so, how have you, how have you addressed that? I, th I think for those that try to implement pluralism at some point, I think it's, it is very interesting. It is very rewarding. It's great to see students engaging, but at the same time, it can be hard. Le learning is sometimes a difficult process as well. Um, and I, even though I, I'm very enthusiastic, enthusiastic about having student engagement and being able to construct knowledge and build concepts together, sometimes I, I've faced this before and it can be tricky when you do certain concepts like, uh, you know, gender division or racial inequalities or things that are more sensitive. sensitive. So I think that what, what I tell students is that, okay, we're trying to understand what is out there, right? And we have to engage and present concepts or frameworks or, or theories that help us to understand what is out there. So even though students sometimes think that some one thing can be useless or oh, this is irrelevant, 
we need to bring that into the classroom and we need to bring that into the debate and show why is that the case. So I want, I, I'd like to hear from them, why do they think that that's a problem? And we can engage in, in that discussion as well. So I think, of course, this is, it depends on, on the teacher sometimes, but that, that's my approach to the, to the issue. I think Juan is back now. Yes, I think we, we, lo we lost you temporarily there, Juan. You were, you're in the middle of a point. Yes, yeah, sorry. Talk, talking about context, you see what happens in my context. <laughs> uh, and I, I was trying to say that I think that it's important to try to imagine, uh, to, to engage into a conversation with the students and to try to imagine also in advance what are the expectations about the class. Uh, I have some expectations about why some students are studying in economics in Colombia. And I think that that's, that's like the first step into, into also uh, trying to, to, hand, to have a language in the class that is not going to make them feel insulted, for example. Uh, I, I, I made my PhD in a faculty of development studies and we have all of these epistemic struggles, et cetera. And, and I remember that in my faculty, always the economists felt that they rejected ones because they were always criticizing them from the Foucauldian point of view, Gramsci, et cetera, et cetera. And they always claim that they didn't understand those critiques. So they simply like put a barrier there. So I think that uh, in the class and also to engage into our types of conversations, uh, trying to imagine what are their expectations and, and, and in the classroom trying to adopt a language that is going to eventually help them to engage with uh, alternative views. Mm. I can add something uh, as well. Um, yeah. I, I really agree with Daniele and I, I think I remembered uh, one of your arguments, uh, Andrew, in one of your papers and also Peter Earle has written on this extensively on the Perry scheme and the importance of, uh, of pluralism and the fact that actually students start with a very black and white um, view of the world when they come to the university and that actually without pluralism and without showing them uh, comparative views, contrasting views, they cannot build critical skills and they cannot actually um, arrive to an open-minded uh, conception of the truth. Um, and so this is, this is, I think, uh, this shows the importance of the role of pluralism in what we are doing. So just to kind of um, add this point. Um, so I think debate is important, showing them contrasting views and that uh, truth is not a monogam kind of, um, or I don't know how to say, um, very unified concept. That's what I mean. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there, um, there are... yeah I, oh, okay. Sorry, okay. Andrew. I, I had just wanted to um, say to, to Stefania's point, um, sometimes the, the best mechanism that I've got to get my students to buy into pluralism is just to link it to like the very visceral, you are more likely to get a job in the 21st century if you are able to think critically. Um, and pluralism is going to encourage you to think critically because any of the information that I'm giving you, you could have just found online probably, right? If it wasn't behind paywalls. Um, so even if you disagree with the pluralism that I'm going to teach you, I'm going to hopefully encourage you to develop the skill of critical thinking. Um, and if machines and robots are likely to be able to take over your job right now, they can't do the art of critical thinking yet. Um, so disagree by all means with all the heterodox approaches, uh, but develop the skill because it's likely to be a door uh, to getting you a job one day. And then just like very developing country context of 40% unemployment, that sells a lot of my students. Mm. Um, there's a, th thank you. There's a, there's a question from... Um somebody who coincidentally is called anonymous attendee. So um, if parents were forward thinking, um, but, but it talks about a lot of effort in economic discourse talking about generalization and what we, we've stressed quite a few times already about context. Um, and I think we were, we were agreeing that pluralism is, pluralism is important to capture elements of context. But I think it links back to the previous question about resistance that um, you can sell somebody a, a very general message and say, well, this is how humans behave, or this is how economies work. And that's possibly easier to sell than the message that, well, actually, in this part of the economy, or in this part of this, this economy, it works like this, but in this part, it's this. How, how do you, at that point, the student may just say, this is, this is impossible, I'm going to go and study something else. How, how, how do you address that? Have you experienced that? How do you, how do you, how do you address that? Any, any, anybody? 
I feel like I've done much too much talking already. So. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, you have to uh, you have to have over uh, overarching generalizations. I, I think uh, those are helpful, and the particular and uh, has to uh, take a back seat to it. I think. The overarching generalization, let's say, that hyperglobalization is a problem, has been a problem. Economists didn't didn't see it coming. Okay, that would be a generalization where you can start a discussion, and then you say, well, in some sectors, maybe that maybe it did work well. For the computer sector in the U.S., uh, it wasn't so bad, right? But in the textile sector, it was a killer. So you have an overarching generalization, and then you can you can uh, make it more nuanced, perhaps. Thanks, John. Any any other responses? Yeah, yes, yeah. I would like to um, add my own interpretation of the question. One way that we could look at this question is whether we heterodox economists believe in exact laws, and whether. Um, really generalization and specificity are conflictual or whether they can be presented as being complementary. Um, I guess decolonization implies that um, we believe in some degree of universality, uh, but we also believe that, as you said, context, cultural and social and economic context is important. But also I think there is a whole movement in, uh, in philosophy of science about the, the no laws kind of um, approach. So um, I personally believe in demi-regularities. I don't believe in exact laws in economics. So in a way I agree with uh, Tony Lawson and many critical realists on, on this point. Uh, so um, I, I, I generally think uh, another point would be, I do remember Fred Lee's insistence that we heterodox economists go too much, we still operate within the mainstream framework with the mainstream concepts and we haven't constructed enough yet to have alternative solutions, alternative concepts and so on. So something that we uh, should think about to be on our agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Um, I just wanted to point out a response from um, uh, the, the, the attendee, the anonymous attendee who says, um, uh, speaking as a student, that the resistance to change only comes in when we don't explicitly know what is expected from the curriculum. Uh, when engaging through multiple forms of resources, it makes it all easier to grapple with the content. So I guess that's about how you frame the, the proposition that you're making to the students. If we're gonna go for a pluralist approach, why are we doing that? What are the issues with that? What are the challenges of doing that? But if, we, if, we, if, that, is, if that is laid out, and perhaps agreed with the students or negotiated with the students, that makes it easier easier to do. Um, I just just wanted to jump back to um, Carlos Carlos's question, which was the second one on the list uh, that that um, Juan wanted to address. Would you yes. like to do that now? Yeah, thanks. It's because of the internet problem. Uh, yeah, I, I like very much the the, the philosopher uh, something that the philosopher Brian Epstein once said, or he says in a in one of his books. He, he, he distinguishes between two types of questions, the, the what is question and the how it works questions. How it works, he defines it as questions about how the, the, do we make that X connects to, to, set, to seat. And this means that uh, it's more like an instrumental type of question. How are we going to solve this type of problem? But he says that often economists particularly and other social scientists fail in trying to ask like what is, what is a type of question, meaning that they don't, for example, ask themselves, what is education? What is an institution? And these type of broader questions that sometimes we take like as granted, I think that if we introduce these type of questions into a classroom, uh, I think that that's also a way uh, to invite the students to be digging inside in, into the social structures. That is very difficult to, to go there without uh, those type of questions. I, 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 and and and, and, and I would like to say something about the, the idea of the generalization. I think that uh, for me, it was extremely useful to study in economics 
then jump a little bit into philosophy. As you have seen, I have quoted lots of critical realism. I'm, I, I, I'm obsessed with that, I would say. And, and I think that generalization is important because generalization is a way of making an, an initial question, so to frame an initial hypothesis. Everything is X, everything is Y. Then the idea is to, uh, for you to have like the tools, the, the research designs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to dig in and then open that generalization and, and bring the nuances in different contexts, etc. But I think that definitely generalization is important at least to start with the abduction. If you allow me to to, to present it like that. Thank, thank you, Juan. Um, I am. Um, this isn't a fashionable view, but I am in favour of finishing on time. Uh, mm -hmm. With that in mind, um, I, I've noticed that uh, Michelle wants to end at the answer the final question that's been asked by uh, Abdul Rashid. The final question, the list, not necessarily the final question. Let's see how it goes. But uh, okay, Michelle, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to be quick so that if anyone else wants to give concluding thoughts, they can. Uh, but I think that this speaks uh, really. Uh, uh, Abdul's question is, you know, how do we as junior academics deal with more established academics um, when we want to change things up and they don't want to agree to, to it? Um, so, I mean, this is inherently a question of, of power and of gatekeeping, and I think we need to call it out for what it is. Um, so, I think that there is a respectful way to try to engage your more established colleagues um, and to uh, make the case for what type of curriculum you want to uh, to teach, to really advocate for pluralism, and um, see where you can meet them potentially halfway, right? Be open-minded to their own ideas too. Um, but if you're going to come up against massive resistance, which um, I certainly have, uh, and maybe this is a little cynical, but uh, in my experience, the more established professors will maybe uh, put up a fight, but then because it relates to teaching, they're more interested in their research and their research outputs. So if you're willing to do the work to create the new resources, to convince the students to get them on board, I think it's massively important for you to um, get your students to be on board and then an established professor uh, doesn't have nearly as much of a voice as what an entire class of students demanding a better quality curriculum does. Um, if you're willing to do the work, they're likely to be more concerned about whether they're going to be able to be published in one of the top five economic journals um, and leave you to do the revolutionizing. Of course, just engage them respectfully, but if you're, if you're coming up against um, a massive resistance, uh, the power of the students and and the fact that you're willing to hold out longer in the fight. That's uh, an interesting response. Thank you. And, and student power is not to be underestimated, particularly when in the world of uh, certainly in the UK, student national student surveys, teaching excellence frameworks. They have their huge flaws, but they they do create another powerful voice, uh, and that does create some opportunities for us. And that possibly it goes to answering. Uh, Hannah's uh, question about how to do this in particular institutional structures. Um, in the spirit of finishing on time, I just wanted to give uh, all, all the panelists a, a chance to say anything very briefly that they feel that they need to say before five o'clock. Any final thoughts? I think yeah. I'm on my side just to say that this was a great panel excellent questions and yeah I was thrilled to hear from the others on different perspectives and different ways of teaching so just a big thank you same yes thanks I, I, I'm just going to say that uh, yesterday I enjoyed a lot with the intervention of Sheila Edao and particularly when she mentioned that we have to migrate to Babylonian, but yeah, she, she said something like that. Babylonian research yeah. science for questions, and I think this is very useful. I think that if we if we start addressing more like specific problems and not necessarily instrumental problems, all type of problems, inequality problems, etc. And if we address problems, maybe with this in this way, we're going to engage more students to become more aware of the importance of pluralism. Thank you. And uh, on that note, uh, if I could just thank you, f myself, panelists, the brilliant uh, presentations, really fascinating. And also thank you to the questions, um, many of which we've, we've answered, but uh, apologies to those uh, that we haven't. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this uh, session. There are more uh, in the conference, the online conference. If you go to hetacon.net, you can see the program there. 
uh, and you can sign on through Zoom in the same way that you've done for today. As I said, please tweet AHE 2020 and please consider uh, donating and joining the association. We'll be very glad to have you. So um, thank you very much all. Um, goodbye. And thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. Very much. We're running a good show. You did that well, Andrew. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Nice seeing you all.